Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to have with us today Dr. Nouriel Roubini. Nouriel needs no introduction. He served at the White House, U.S. Treasury, IMF, uh, is a professor at NYU and chairman of Roubini Macro Associates. Uh, we have plenty to talk about today. So thank you all for joining us and feel free to ask any question in the chat box. This webinar is a collaboration between the family office, a leading multifamily office in the GCC, and Petiol, the asset manager headquartered in Zurich and specialized in long-term private market investing strategies. Uh, the talk will be inspired from Nouriel's latest book, Mega Threats, and we will not only cover global markets and economics, we will also cover artificial intelligence, Cold War 2.0 investing. Nouriel, thank you for being with us today. Uh, it's a great pleasure being with you. Thank you. Um, let's uh, kick it off. I mean, you predicted the housing bubble in 2006. What are you predicting for 2023? First of all, thank you very much for having me. It's really a great pleasure and honor. Uh, we live in a period of time of uh, what I refer to as uh, unexpected, unusual, uh, unprecedented uh, uncertainty. There are four U's. Uh, we live in a time in which there is lots of uh, risk in the global economy. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, there are lots of downsides that we have to start to think about. And uh, my book uh, is titled Mega Threats, uh, 10 Dangerous Trends that Imperial Our Future and How to Survive Them. It's a book about the long run, uh, what's going to happen to the world economy and the world at large in the next decade or two. But many of these uh, mega threats that I discuss are materializing today. So they're not just about uh, the long term future, but they are about the present. And today, in addition to economic, monetary, and financial risks, and some of these risks are old and some of them are new. For example, we have now the return of inflation, uh, the return of negative supply shocks, and the risk of stagflation, the buildup of private and public debts that may lead to significant debt crises. But we will also live in a world in which there is uh, other types of threats that are connected to the economic, monetary, and financial. There are, gonna, there are geopolitical threats, given the division in the world. There are environmental threats coming from global climate change. There are health threats, given the recurrence of severe global pandemics. But there are also threats coming from technology, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic, automation, because all this technological innovation may increase the economic pie, but they also lead to potentially long-term permanent uh, technological unemployment. And they may also lead to a rise in income and wealth uh, inequality. We also have a backlash against uh, globalization and hyper-globalization. Uh, there is a return to protectionism, to fragmentation and balkanization of the global economy and global supply chains. Talk about uh, secure trade rather than free trade. Talk about uh, reshoring of manufacturing rather than offshoring and of French shoring rather than offshoring. And there are also political challenges. Uh, there is a backlash against uh, liberal democracy and there are extremist authoritarian populist uh, regimes of the extreme right and the extreme left that are coming to power, both in advanced economies and uh, in emerging markets. So we live in a world in which there are threats that are also political, geopolitical, technological, environmental, health, trade related, and so on, in addition to economic. And they're all interrelated with each other. It's a bit like a 10 by 10 matrix. Now, if I have to focus for now on some of the uh, short term economic outlook that is connected with some of these threats, I would notice that. Um, the conventional wisdom uh, of, for example, Wall Street or the city or policymakers has been proven somehow wrong in the last uh, year and a half. As you recollect, uh, in uh, last year, there was a debate on whether the rise in inflation in advanced economies, but also in many emerging markets, was uh, temporary and transitory or more persistent and more permanent. The consensus view by among central bankers and 
uh, cell side research was it was temporary and transitory, driven by base effects and temporary uh, supply shocks. The reality turned out to be different. Inflation went towards double digits in most advanced economies, and it's still very high. Then there was a, another way in which the conventional wisdom uh, was incorrect. People stressed that inflation was driven mostly by bad uh, policies, uh, excessively loose monetary, fiscal, and credit easing, and policies during the COVID crisis that led to excessive uh, inflation over time. That was true. Certainly, loose monetary, fiscal, and credit policy was part of the story. But uh, my contribution and the one of others to this debate was to also point out that in addition to bad uh, policies, there was also called uh, bad luck, a series of negative aggregate uh, supply shocks that reduced economic growth, increased cost of production, and they were stagflationary. Uh, the three most important were the initial impact of COVID on the production of goods and services, on the supply of labor, and on disrupting global supply chains. The second one was the impact of the brutal invasion of Ukraine by Russia on energy prices, both oil and natural gas, on food and fertilizer prices, and on the price of industrial metals. And finally, the continuation of the zero COVID policy of China, at least until recently, created other bottlenecks to production in China and to global supply chain. Now, this debate on whether it was a bad uh, policy or bad luck uh, is not just semantic and academic, it's relevant. Because if uh, negative supply shocks that are stagflationary emerge, then the chances for central banks to achieve a soft landing become harder because with negative supply shocks, uh, growth is lower, inflation is higher. If you tighten monetary policy to fight inflation, you risk causing a hard landing. And if instead you care about jobs and growth and incomes and you don't tighten fast enough, then there is a risk of de-anchoring of inflation and inflation expectation and you end up into a wage price pattern. So, when these negative supply shocks occur, uh, for central bank is a bit of a dam if you do, and a dam if you don't, in trying to achieve uh, their, their goals of having a soft landing back to 2% inflation without a recession. Then, of course, the third way in which the conventional wisdom, I think, has become uh, incorrect is by once it was recognized uh, that uh, there was a need for policy tightening, the question was, can central banks go back to 2% inflation without causing a recession, uh, without having a hard landing, having a soft landing, where you have a slowdown of economic growth uh, without having a real recession. And for a while, that was the consensus view again among central bankers and sales side research that we can achieve a, a soft landing. Even those hopes, I think, by now have been dashed because if you're looking at the United Kingdom, you have double digit inflation and you are already entering a recession. Uh, the Bank of England is already predicting five consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. The ECB is going to meet uh, this week. They're likely to revise downward their growth expectation and expect at least a couple of quarters of negative economic growth in the fourth quarter of this year right now, first quarter of next year, and possibly the second quarter of next year. Uh, that will be technically a recession at a time where inflation is close to double digits against stagflation. In the US, we're not yet in a recession, but there is a sharp slowdown of economic activity. And I do predict, uh, again, a hard landing rather than a soft landing, uh, because uh, in US history, we have never had a situation where inflation is above 5%, and today is 7.7. And when uh, unemployment rate is below 5%, and today is 3.7, but when the Fed starts raising rates <clears throat> to reduce inflation, uh, you never get a soft landing. You always get <clears throat> a recession. So I think the direction of uh, the key economies of the world, at least advanced economy, is one of uh, stagflation. The question of how mild or how severe. Uh, and in emerging market, there is this very sharp slowdown of growth uh, in China uh, until recently. And they have recently tried to change their policies. They're going to re-emphasize the importance of economic growth. Uh, they're going to phase out the zero COVID policies. But the overall policy stance of China is state capitalism, 
bashing the private sector, bashing the tech sector, and the confidence of both the household and the business sector remain fragile. So I do expect that China has been growing barely 2 to 3% this year, may not grow much more than that uh, next year. So technically, that's not a recession for China, but for an economy that used to grow 10% and then 5 going to 2 3% is equivalent of, of a hard landing. So my outlook is one for, uh, you know, a global recession. And by now, I would think that most people have moved away from the view we're going to have a soft landing. And the new conventional wisdom is that instead of having a soft landing, we'll have a softish landing, meaning we're going to have a short and shallow recession, a garden variety recession, a plain vanilla recession, maybe a couple of quarters of negative economic growth, followed then by a very sharp drop of wage and price inflation that leads then central bank to uh, cut policy rates by the second half of next year. So you have a, a mild uh, recession. That's the new consensus. There'll be a short and shallow recession. Uh, I beg to differ uh, even on that one. I think that if they we're going to get the recession, it's going to be more severe than otherwise for a number of reasons. Reason number one is that uh, in previous episodes, like the global financial crisis and the COVID initial crisis, we enter a recession by easing monetary credit and fiscal policy because uh, initially those shocks were deflationary, a fall in aggregate demand. This time around, because inflation is rising and we have negative supply shocks, we're entering the recession by having to tighten monetary and credit policy, and there is limited room for stimulating the economy on the fiscal side. Secondly, we now live in a world in which uh, debt ratios, private and public, as a share of GDP, are very high, uh, much higher than they were in the 1970s when the private and public debt as a share of GDP was uh, about 100%. Today, in advanced economies, the number is 420% of GDP and rising. In China, it's 330% of GDP and rising. So in the past, there were many institutions, household, corporates, banks, shadow banks, government, entire countries that were near insolvent, near bankrupt, called them zombies. But because we had negative demand shocks, we ease monetary, and fiscal, and credit policy. So we save the, unquote, the zombies uh, by cutting rates to zero, to negative, by doing quantitative easing, credit easing, buying even junk bonds. Uh, this time around, instead, uh, because inflation is rising and you have these negative supply shocks, uh, you have to raise interest rates into that recession. And therefore, in the past, debt ratios were high, but debt servicing ratio was low. Today, instead, we have to raise rates and debt servicing ratios are rising. Mortgages, business loans, credit card, personal loans, auto loans, student loans, uh, you name it. Uh, but, uh, junk bonds, high yield, high, high grade, leverage loans, CLOs, private debt, and so on. And that rise in interest rates is going to lead to distress among the institutions that are near insolvent. And that financial distress is going to make the recession more severe and the more severe recession is going to lead to more financial distress. So I expect that the recession is not going to be short and shallow. It's going to be more severe and more protracted. And everybody is tightening policy rates, with the exception of maybe China and Japan. So it's a global phenomenon as inflation is becoming a global phenomenon. Final way in which I think that the consensus is probably incorrect is that right now, consensus, the markets, the policymakers say, we're going to fight inflation at any cost, whatever it takes to go, to go back to 2%. We're going to increase interest rates as much as is needed. And that's why inflation expectation for the time being are anchored. However, my fear is that central banks are going to wimp out, they're going to blink, and they're not going to fight inflation uh, and bring back inflation to 2% for a couple of reasons. One, if they do so, there is a recession and I argue why this recession is going to be short and shallow. Two, central banks are in what uh, the economists at the BIS call a debt trap. There is so much private and public debt in the system that if you raise interest rates enough to fight inflation, not only you cause a recession, but you also cause financial instability. Uh, you cause financial distress uh, in debt markets, in uh, 
government bond markets, in credit markets, and of course in the stock market. And therefore faced with an economic and financial crash, central banks are going to wimp out. And if you cannot raise uh, either uh, taxes or spending control deficits and debts that are unsustainable, the part of least resistance becomes to have a bout of unexpected inflation to reduce the real value of nominal long-term fixed rate uh, debt. And the bout of uh, unexpected inflation can for a while delay a debt crisis. It only delays it because if inflation goes only from say 2% average to 5-6, you have a couple of years of unexpected inflation. But once then inflation expectations are revised upward, nominal rates go higher, real rates have to go higher because the inflation risk premium are gonna be higher. And therefore then down the line, those agents in the economy that are having high debts are gonna still face high nominal rates, uh, double digits and high real rates. And therefore they're eventually gonna become insolvent. So you can postpone the crisis, uh, the debt crisis with unexpected uh, you know, inflation for a while, but you cannot fool all of the people all the time. Once uh, expected inflation gets repriced, once real rates go higher, uh, short-term debt repriced higher, and maturing longer-term debt has to be refinanced at much higher interest rates. So you still have debt crisis. So in my view, not only we get inflation, not only we get recession, not only we get the first stagflation, but we get eventually a stagflationary debt crisis. We, the days of the great moderation, where inflation was low, growth was stable, equity prices were rising, bond yields were falling, and bond prices were rising. Uh, those years are in some sense over, and we're going from the great moderation to the great uh, stagflationary uh, debt crisis and instability. So on all these dimensions, five different dimensions, I would say, conventional wisdom has turned out to be wrong. And on the last two ones, of course, the, the debate is still open on whether short and shallow recession and whether central bank will remain hawkish or gonna wimp out. I try to make the argument of why we're going in, in that direction. Now, in addition to these uh, short-term economic and financial and monetary risks, and as I pointed out, inflation is a new risk like we didn't have for the last 30 years. Stagflation is a new risk that we didn't have for the last uh, few decades. And severe debt crises are also something new. We had them before, but the magnitude and the severity this time around is severe. We have also a number of other things that we have to uh, worry about. We have to worry about uh, uh, climate change. We have to worry about uh, 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 geopolitical depression. We have to worry about what's gonna happen with AI, machine learning, robotic, and automation. Now, just a few important points about uh, these specific uh, meta mega threats, and maybe then I'll stop and start uh, the Q&A. Uh, we live in a geopolitical depression right now in which there is a number of uh, revisionist powers, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, that are challenging the economic, social, political, trading, financial, but also geopolitical order that the US, uh, with Europe, the West, and their allies created after World War II. They want a different order. We already have cold wars that are getting colder, and we already have the beginning of hot wars. Uh, that's happened in the case of Russia and Ukraine, a conflict that may, may become uh, unconventional, that may involve NATO. That's the risk that is expanding in those dangerous directions. In the Middle East, uh, you have uh, an Iran that is becoming effectively a nuclear threshold state, uh, something that is perceived by Israel as being a threat, an existential threat. And there is that then there will be a conflict uh, between Iran on one side and Israel and potentially United States on the other one is a significant risk. And regarding US and China, where a Cold War is becoming colder, is leading to decoupling, trading goods in services, in the movement of capital, foreign direct investment, labor, data, technology, and innovation. And on the issue of Taiwan, uh, this conflict eventually may even end up into, into a hot war. And of course, the little dictator in North Korea is seeing all the attention going towards uh, Ukraine or Iran or Taiwan. And he says, me too, me too. And he's sending rockets, uh, you know, on the Sea of Japan or towards uh, South Korea. 
and it's dangerous having nuclear weapon. So we live in this geopolitical depression that unfortunately is gonna increase the risk of fragmentation, of division of the global economy, of balkanization, of French shoring, of secure trade, of uh, divisions and decoupling and balkanization and protectionism and trade and currency wars and imposition of trade and financial sanctions in a way that's gonna divide the world. So it has severe economic consequences on the other side that have to be uh, addressed. We also have, of course, uh, the revolution coming from artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic and automation. The hope is that, of course, the economic pie becomes bigger and growth becomes uh, stronger. Uh, that's uh, the case. However, AI has also dark sides. Uh, it leads to essentially permanent technological unemployment as uh, not only traditional blue collar routine jobs can be automated with robots and machines, uh, but it also the case that cognitive jobs that are mostly white collar can be divided and sliced into different tasks that can be automated. And now there is a revolution also in white collar jobs being automated. But now with what has happened recently, we've evolved this with transformers, GPT, and now the chat uh, GPT, even creative jobs or eventually over time can be automated. So uh, the machines can create pieces of art, or pieces of music, write interesting uh, paper, make scientific discovery of one sort or another. So that's one risk, permanent technological unemployment. The other risk of technology is that while the economic pie becomes bigger, income and wealth inequality becomes larger because these technological innovations are capital intensive, skill bias and labor saving. So if you own the machines or the capital is on the machines, you're gonna do well. If you're in the top 10% distribution of education, skills, human capital, like I'm sure everybody in this call, then for a while the AI and the machine learning becomes you, makes you more smart and more productive. But if you are a blue collar or a white collar worker in low value added industries, but even middle value added industries, increasingly your job, your income, your wages, your livelihood is gonna be threatened by AI, robotic and automation. And the final dark side of technology is that unfortunately, many technological innovations occur because governments want to build the bigger and more deadly weapons uh, to fight wars against their own strategic rivals. You know, we had the first era of industrialization and globalization, and it did not prevent World War I fought with weapons that were built during that phase, first stage of industrialization. And then in the 20s and 30s, we built the weapons that led then to fighting the ugly World War II. And World War II ended with uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki with the use of nuclear weapons that were created again to fight wars and was only after the then civilian application of nuclear power were found. And today, the race on who's gonna win, the race on AI between US and China is not only a race on who's gonna be dominating the industries of the future. They're all gonna be a combination of AI, machine learning, internet of things with billions of sensors collecting big data that then 5G and 6G can use to then create better goods and services. Uh, not only whether we're in, this race is going to dominate the Institute of the future, but whoever wins that race is going to also be the biggest geopolitical and military and security power in the world because the weapon system will be increasingly autonomous, autonomous drones, robo soldiers, cyber warfare, and so on and so on. So the future of warfare is effectively AI, machine learning, robotic, automation, and eventually even quantum related computing and, and so on. That's why this year there was a book written in the US by on one side, Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, and the other side, Henry Kissinger, who is the most famous and known geopolitical strategist in America. And the point about the book was who wins the race on AI between US and China not only dominates the world economy in this century, but also is the hegemonic military and security power in the world economy. And unfortunately, this Cold War is becoming colder and the risk of eventually conflict between US and China is becoming severe. I'll make just one final point about, uh, you know, energy, energy markets. 
there is a green transition occurring right now, but what has been happening for the last few years is that uh, probably rightly, uh, stakeholders, shareholders, financial sector, politicians have been bashing uh, big oil by saying it creates uh, fossil fuels, create a high greenhouse gas emission. And at least the big oil in the private sector has been reacting to it by reducing an uh, investment into new capacity. Sovereigns maybe are different. Sovereigns in the Gulf and otherwise are less subject to this kind of pressure and they've maintained that uh, somehow production and capacity. But uh, big oil companies around the world are investing less capacity. So we have less capacity for fossil fuels, but the increase in the production of renewable energy has occurred, but at a slower pace that does not replace the reduced capacity uh, and supply of energy coming from fossil fuels. So there is a structural uh, supply imbalance uh, and given normal demand, even with modest global growth, uh, there is less supply than there is demand. And that's why uh, energy prices were rising sharply even before uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. At some point before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Brent was already close to $100 a barrel. And the fact that now energy prices have fallen somehow from the peak following the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is not because there is significant higher amounts of supply, but it's rather that now because there is the likelihood of a global recession, demand is low. And that low demand is pushing the prices down. So I would say over time, we're going to have a structural uh, lack of supply of uh, fossil fuels. We're not going to have enough uh, renewable. This is ramping up, but not fast enough. And therefore, energy prices may remain uh, elevated. And therefore, the transition to, uh, say, a green transition is occurring more slowly than otherwise. Given the rise in uh, fossil fuel prices, governments are not increasing carbon taxes to switch to renewables, but actually are reducing them as a way of trying to reduce the increase in inflation and the price of energy. And that slows down that type of a green transition. So there is a lot of, uh, in the climate change space, of greenwashing and green wishing. A lot of ESG is more rhetoric than factual. And we also have green inflation. <clears throat> green inflation because the high price of uh, fossil fuels implies that the production of those green metals are needed for the green transition, lithium, cobalt, or otherwise, is expensive because energy is an important input into that. So we get these side effects. So while moving to a green transition might be desirable, in my view, it's going to occur more slowly than otherwise, and we have a fundamental lack of supply in energy market that may maintain over the next few years uh, energy prices elevated, even if, of course, a global recession might lead to a correction downwards in those energy prices on a cyclical basis. Maybe, maybe I can stop here and open it to questions and so on. Thanks. Thank you, Noriel, for uh, this overview. Let me ask you, since you touch on energy at the end, and uh, um, I mean, you spent a lot of time in the, in the Gulf countries, GCC, and we have many, many people from today who are attending from this region. How do you see it in the next 10 to 20 years? Do you, do you see them you see this region facing the same mega threats as you outlined in your book, or you see that more of a mega opportunity given what you have outlined on the on the energy side? <clears throat> well, on the opportunity side, you have uh, the fact that, as I pointed out, uh, for the time being, energy prices are going to be elevated, and these countries are running very large uh, surpluses, external surpluses that lead to a buildup of net foreign assets, even on the fiscal side, they're, they're doing much better. And all these resources can be then used not only to build uh, through the sovereign wealth funds assets that are going to provide a source of income and wealth for the country, but also the ability to do investments, investments locally into the capital stock, public and private, and building up the infrastructure uh, to sustain high economic growth and do the kind of reforms that are necessary also to have a transition and a diversification because every country wants a little bit to become like, uh, say, Dubai, diversify away from just uh, oil and energy into manufacturing, into services, into technology, into the knowledge economy. So the opportunity is that with uh, high revenues, high surpluses, uh, and this windfall, if invested properly, then uh, this country can do well. 
However, these countries are also subject to the same kind of uh, issues uh, and threats that we, 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 we are facing. You know, they import most of their goods and services. If there's global inflation, uh, you know, inflation is going to be higher. And many of them are packed to the US dollar. They can import inflation. Inflation has been lower than advanced economies because there are fiscal subsidies that are significant, that are provided that keep a lead on inflation. But otherwise, inflation uh, will, be, will be higher. Uh, this country do not have severe debt problems, and that's a positive. But they are in a region of the world that is geopolitically complicated, if not dangerous. As I said, uh, the issue of uh, Iran and the possible threat of Iran and the confrontation between Iran and Israel and possibly the US remains a, a hot issue. The risk of a conflict is one that is serious. It's a region that is subject, like many other ones, to severe risk from global climate change. In most the kind of global climate change scenario, temperatures become very high in that region and life becomes much more hard and more difficult in terms of you know having uh, droughts and uh, and having heat uh, levels and temperature levels that make life and work not as easy and sustainable of course global pandemics are a serious problem for everybody in my view they're going to occur and they're going to spread globally nobody can shelter themselves from it and you have also in some of these countries uh, very young populations, uh, say in Saudi Arabia. Uh, many of them work only in the public sector, not in the private sector. And you have to give jobs and opportunity to these people because otherwise eventually there is social unrest. People want to have economic opportunity. As I said, uh, Saudi Arabia, like others, have the resources then to do a transition to stronger growth, job creation, and so on. But you have the challenge of doing these economic reforms and eventually AI, robotic, automation, machine learning can also displace many kind of low-end jobs, even in those economies uh, of the Gulf. So, you know, no, no country in the world is, is an island. Everybody's interconnected. And many of these global threats, whether it's political, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's environmental, whether it's health, whether it's related to uh, deglobalization, are things are going to be, to some extent, affecting the Gulf. But relatively speaking, this past year, uh, the Gulf has been actually a success story because for whatever reason that we discussed, uh, you have had elevated energy prices and therefore the windfalls have been significant. Uh, that has been a positive in terms of threat shock for the Gulf. Of course, there's been a negative in terms of threat shock for energy importing uh, economies, whether they are advanced economies or other emerging markets that are uh, energy and commodity importing as opposed to being exporting. Yeah, there's a question around asset allocation. When you look at the current market environment and the threats that you have mentioned, um, I know there's a part in your book where you refer, when you refer to AI, you refer to having exposure to these type of businesses more toward the private market side, private equity, venture capital. So how do you think about a a portfolio construction asset allocation and the traditional 40-60 balance portfolio and against those threats? Well, a traditional 60-40 uh, portfolio, 16 equities and 14 safer long duration bonds works when inflation is low, because when inflation is low, there is a negative correlation between equity prices and bond prices, risk on, risk off, growth and recession. When one does well, the other doesn't, and vice versa. But when inflation is rising, like this past year, equities take a hit because the discount factor for those uh, profits and dividends is the bond yield is rising. And long duration assets like growth stocks, tech stocks, VC, actually are even more significantly hurt by rising interest rates because long duration assets are more sensitive to interest rates. But not only the 60 part of your portfolio gets hurt, and US and global equity fell about 15 to 20 percent this year. But uh, as bond yields rise, uh, then the price of bonds is falling. And in US, uh, the bond yield went from below 1 percent to close to 4 percent and now slightly below. So actually, bond prices this year fell more than equity prices. So you lost more money on the 40 percent of your portfolio than on the 61. And everybody has either 60-40 or 70-30 or some risk parity variants of the same. And everybody has some exposure 
uh, to dollar assets, either treasuries or things that are spread relative to treasuries like a lot of EM debt or corporate debt, high yield, high grade. And anyhow, in a world of rising inflation, not only US treasuries, but also uh, boons and gilts and other long-term bonds go higher because you have the same phenomenon of inflation. So you get the same market losses. Um, and this year was a year in which there was nowhere to easily hide. Uh, public equities did poorly. Private equity, if you do it mark to market, did poorly. REITs uh, did poorly. Of course, as I said, growth, VC, tech did even more poorly. And of course, all the bubbles, meme stocks, crypto, SPACs went bust. Uh, credit did poorly because bond yields were rising and credit spreads were widening and bonds uh, did poorly. Even cash gave you a negative uh, real return as you had uh, almost double digit inflation. Um, so if you want to think about uh, how you protect yourself, protect yourself in a world of uh, rising inflation, my view, you should have uh, exposure to short term treasuries that reprice at a higher yield without the price impact of long duration assets. Uh, you have to have inflation index bonds like TIPS and others. Uh, you might want to be exposed to gold and other precious metals and maybe some of these gray metals because gold and precious metals do well when there is inflation, when there is debasement of fiat currency, where there are political and geopolitical risks. If U.S. is going to weaponize the dollar and impose sanctions, the strategic rivals of U.S. are going to move away from dollar assets. In the past, they could go into euro or yen, but now the West has imposed same sanctions uh, for against uh, Russia, including not just dollar asset, but also euro, yen, pound, Swiss franc. So gold is the only asset that is kept in a vault, say in Beijing or Moscow, cannot be seized by the West and is a traditional international store of value. And gold can be also a broader hedge against a financial crisis. And finally, historically, real estate does better than equities. Uh, whenever there is moderate and rising inflation, as long as there is not much tighter monetary policy, because there's an uh, asset in relative fixed supply in the short run and has more market uh, pricing power on rents. However, a good amount of uh, residential commercial real estate is going to be stranded even in North America because of global climate change. It's going to lead to flood, sea rise level, hurricanes, uh, wildfires, droughts, uh, and you name it. So you have to choose investments in real estate that are, how to say, protected from global climate change. So those are the kind of investments that protect you against the type of uh, tail risk we're facing right now. Of course, over medium long term, we'll be in a world of not just digitalization, but hyper digitalization. The way we live, we work, we study, we socialize, we shop, we do business is going to be all in increasingly digital. And those firms that are in the hyper digitalization are going to do better over time but you have to pick the the right ones and the winners uh, there were many uh, vc supported firms that didn't have a clear business plan they didn't have real revenues they didn't have profits and uh, many of them have lost 50 60 70 80 percent with the rise in interest rates because uh, those long duration assets that don't even have a flow a stream of income uh, then then they get really in trouble uh, when you have a rise in interest rates and a rise in inflation. So, yeah, you have to invest into the industries and the firms of the future. Many of them are not in public markets and people have access to private equity, to VC and so on, can do well, but you have to be pick and choosing. We're going to be the winners in AI, in machine learning, in robotic, in automation, in biotech, in quantum, and lots of other industries of, of the future as well. Um, uh, I'm conscious of time, so uh, let us uh, take a few more questions, uh, Nuriel, if it's okay. Um, so I think people are um, at looking at the initial talk you had related to the mega threats, and 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 they want to hear maybe a bit of that optimism potentially. I, I mean, you say you're not Doctor Doom, you're Doctor Realist, um, and if you think about some of the points that um, are what makes you more optimistic. Uh, of the of the world going forward, maybe we, you can highlight that optimistic view as well. Well, in the book, there are initially ten chapters. Each one of them is about one of these mega threats. But in each chapter, I speak about the policy solutions that are available, and I make a point that there are solutions to each one of these threats. But all of them 
requires some sacrifices, some costs in the short run in order to build a, a better future in the medium long term. So there are things we can do. The question is whether they are politically viable in a world where we discount the future and we care more about the present. But as long as we care more about the future, there are ways of addressing each one of these threats. Then I have two final chapters. One, of course, about the dystopian future where all these threats materialize and feed on each other. And another one is more utopian, where step by step we have leadership at the national level, international level, we have cooperation, private sector, public sector, individual to address these threats. So leadership is important, but we also need a little bit of good luck with technologies because, you know, technological innovation in the past has increased the economic pie. Even recently, the fact that we were able to uh, control COVID successfully is because we found the vaccine in less than a year. And that was due in part to using sophisticated AI and machine learning. So that's, that's the way in which technology can do revolution in biotech, in healthcare, in longevity, you name it. Some technological solutions may also lead us to have a better climate uh, by using these technologies. There is hope, for example, in addition to renewable now, there is a hope that fusion technology may lead us to very cheap energy with zero greenhouse gas emission in the, in the future, in the next 10, 15 years. And there have been some breakthroughs in fusion, again, aided by having uh, AI machine learning and quantum computing, among other, other tools. So I think that the solution towards a better future starts with uh, leadership, national, international, private and public sector, and then they have to be supported by having a continuation of technological innovation that help us to address problem of climate change, of uh, pandemics, of uh, increasing the economic pie and providing opportunity to more people, more skills, more education, more productivity to a larger number of humanity. So if we have that, sets of conditions then we may end up into the less dystopian uh, or more utopian future and there is hope uh, the future is never deterministic at the end of the day history is decided by individuals and countries that can work together to improve the world or they can fight and destroy this world and cause a lot of damage hopefully cooperation and coordination uh given new technology is going to lead us to go in the right direction as opposed to the wrong direction and, and last question, uh, I would like to talk about to Professor Rubini, not the economist Rubini. You teach at NYU. What, what life lessons are you giving your young students or the younger generation today to succeed in the future? Um, well, it's an important question because uh, if you are a young person born today, a man or a woman, uh, your life expectancy in a middle income country is at 100 years at birth. So you're gonna be around for the next uh, 100 years. Or even if you're in college now, uh, you know, you'll be living for at least another 80 years. And the question is, given all these changes and threats and disruptions, uh, you know, how, how you can make sure that, for example, you're not gonna be technologically obsolete because technology is gonna disrupt many jobs, many firms, many businesses, many line of work. Uh, there'll be a revolution and so on. You know, my advice will be that everybody, young person, should know a little bit about technology. So you should major in something uh, related to STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and computer science. But you also need a minor in liberal arts, because if you're going to have to change jobs 10 times during your lifetime, you have to know how to think well, to read well, to write well. And those kind of skills are also quite useful. So some combination of liberal arts major and minor in STEM or major in STEM and minor in that. That may make you a well-rounded person that's going to be able then survive and thrive in spite of all these uh, technological disruptions. And in terms of investment, uh, you know, uh, nobody becomes honestly overnight richer by gambling in Mimi stock or crypto or SPACs or other stuff that is highly speculative. Uh, the solution, as anybody was an investor to long-term uh, uh, wealth, is to study hard, work hard, save a meaningful fraction of your uh, income, and invest in a diversified portfolio of a variety of risky 
and riskless assets. And if you do that uh, over the decades, you're going to be able to have, you know, enough savings to live comfortably in, uh, in old age life. Because uh, social security system right now, because of aging, those that are pay as you go are not going to be able 20, 30, 40 years from now to provide the benefits to the currently young, uh, the same benefits that they currently all get. So there'll be only a fraction of your retirement uh, income. You have to supplement it by having private uh, savings uh, that lead you then to build up of financial wealth. It's going to make you comfortable in old age. So, so you have to start studying hard the right things, uh, work hard, and then save appropriately for the long term in a very diversified global portfolio of a variety of assets, including some of those that are the firms and the industries, of course, of the future. Great. Thank you, Nuriel, for joining us today. And this concludes our webinar. Thanks for having me. It was a great pleasure and honor. Mm -hmm.